Welcome back to the series. In the last video, we removed security vulnerabilities by adding testing and automatic verifications to our application. In this section, we'll continue to make our application more secure by focusing on a unique issue for decentralized applications, non-participation. Non-participation refers to the act of one party refusing to continue playing their role in an application. In traditional client-server programs like a web server, this would be the case of a client not sending any more requests to the server, or the server not sending any responses to the client. In these sorts of traditional programs, non-participation is an exceptional circumstance that normally leads to an error message for clients, or at most, a log entry for servers. It's not necessary for designers of client-server applications to spend lots of time considering the consequences of non-participation. However, this is something that decentralized applications must think about. For example, consider what happens in our game if Alice pays her wager, but Bob never accepts it. The application doesn't continue. In this case, Alice's network tokens would be locked inside the contract and lost to her. Similarly, if Bob accepted and paid his wager, Alice could stop participating and never submit her hand. With this case, both of their funds would be locked away forever. Let's take a look at how we can handle this issue with Reach. If you want to learn more about non-participation, be sure to check out the guide in the description. In Reach, non-participation is handled through a timeout mechanism. If a given user doesn't make a decision in time, the response times out and consequences occur. Let's integrate this feature into our Rock, Paper, Scissors application. First, we'll modify the Participant Interact interface to allow the front end to know that a timeout has occurred. This will be in the form of a function that will take in no inputs and have no outputs. The backend will use or call this function when a timeout has occurred, and the front end will have some implementation for this function. Let's add that implementation. We'll jump over to the front end and add inform timeout. For the implementation, we'll just print out that a timeout has occurred. Back in the reach program, we'll create a variable that will act as a standard time deadline throughout the program. Alice will provide this value for the variable just like she proposes the wager. So we'll go to the Alice participant and add deadline. This will be a uint. The deadline variable will serve as some number of time delta units. The notion of time is abstracted here as a number of rounds or blocks. Let's start it off as 10 units of time on the front end. We'll jump to the front end, go to Alice, and add the deadline, 10 units. Now back in the reach code, let's define a helper function to inform each participant of the timeout. This will prevent our other logic from getting too cluttered with details. When a timeout occurs, we'll just use this helper function. This function will be called inform timeout. For each participant, Alice and Bob, will do the following. The function performed by Alice and Bob individually will take in no inputs. It'll use the interact object to call the inform timeout function implemented on the front end. Now, similar to how Alice declassifies and publishes the wager, we'll also have her declassify and publish the deadline. Both the deadline and the wager are not secret, so we don't need to use commitments. Now for Bob, we'll want to add a timeout. If he fails to publish his hand, 
then Alice's tokens are stuck in the contract. We can add a timeout by using the timeout function on Bob. We'll feed in the deadline value, so how long Bob has to publish his hand. And we'll also add a handler function. The handler function is what's used when the timeout is reached, so when Bob has not responded. In this case, the handler function takes in no inputs and calls close to. Close to is a function built into reach, and in this case, it transfers all the funds in the contract to Alice, since Alice is the input. After transferring the funds, it calls the inform timeout function. That's what we just defined above, and this informs both Alice and Bob of the timeout. This means if Bob fails to publish his hand, then Alice will take her network tokens back. We can also add a similar timeout function to Alice's second step. If Alice fails to respond, we'll give Bob all the tokens in the contract. Then, we'll inform each front end of the timeout, just like before. Now you might think that it would be fair for Alice's funds to be returned to Alice and Bob's funds to be returned to Bob. However, if we implemented it in that way, then Alice would always time out if she was going to lose, which she knows will happen because she already knows her hand and Bob's hand, since Bob published his hand to the network. Our application is now robust against non-participation, and it only took a few lines of code. To manually test our application, Let's modify the front end to deliberately cause a timeout. Instead of having Bob accept the wager automatically, we'll create an asynchronous function that takes in the wager amount. Half the time, the function will time out. To emulate this timeout, we'll use the random function from the built-in JavaScript math library. If the random number is less than 0.5, we'll time out. Otherwise, we'll have Bob accept the wager. This is called an if statement, and it's a very common tool in many different programming languages. If the statement between the parentheses is true, then the code in the first set of curly braces will be executed. If the statement between the parentheses is false, then the else clause will be executed. That's the code between the else curly braces. Now to make Bob time out, we'll have Bob take 10 units of time to make a decision, since the deadline we hard-coded or wrote out is 10. On each unit of time, we'll have Bob print out a message saying he's taking his time. To do this, we can use a for loop. This is another common programming mechanism we can use to control the flow or execution of a program. This for loop creates a variable called i and initializes it to zero. While i is less than 10, the program will execute the code within the curly braces. On each execution, it will increment i. Since i starts at zero, and it will continue to execute the code in the curly brackets until i is 10, the code in the curly brackets will get executed 10 times. So we'll write console.log, Bob takes his sweet time. Then we'll use a function from the reach standard library and force the program to wait one unit of time. That's the implementation. Now you might be wondering why we had to make this function asynchronous. It has to do with the intricacies of JavaScript. This reach function, wait, is an asynchronous function. This means we have to make the function we're creating asynchronous as well. We've mentioned this previously, but we use the await keyword to force the async function to be called. 
Let's run the program and see what happens. And it looks like we have an error. Using a bare value as a time argument is now deprecated. Please use relative time, absolute time, relative seconds, or absolute seconds. Let's go to the reach code and wrap our deadline with relative time. We'll also do this for the second timeout. Let's compile it again. And it looks like we're good to go. Let's run it. No timeout yet. Let's run it again. And we finally get a timeout. Alice plays scissors and Bob takes his time. Eventually, Bob does play a hand, paper, but it's too late. Alice and Bob have already observed the timeout, and Alice gets her tokens back from the contract. We've manually tested that the program is robust against either participant dropping from the game. Thank you again to Algorand and Reach for sponsoring the series. If you have any questions about blockchain development, please join me in the Reach Discord in the Days of Blockchain channel. I'll see you next time and happy coding.